Namaskar. <coughs> this is Shubankar Shengupta from uh, Bolkata, representing the Eastern India office of the uh, tourist office of the government of India. Today we are having uh, a live session on textile trail of India, which is organized by the Minister of Tourism, Government of India, on the occasion of 75th year of India's national freedom. And on this occasion, we are going to present an overall view of uh, textile and related tourism activities of the country. We have with us Shreya Sharkar, a craft expert who is in the field for the last eight years and is traveling all around the country with the different uh, modes of crafts and textiles, especially in the rural Bengal. So we will share our experience with Shreya. Welcome, Shreya. And uh, I think uh, we can start talking to our uh, guests today about the various textile activities of India. Shreya. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sengupta. Uh, you and I both know that if we start talking about the textiles of India, this is like a vast, vast subject which cannot be uh, compressed within a given time. So what I'd like to uh, tell the viewers that we would rush through some of the textiles that are really, really important. And we might also miss out on some, but uh, we have chosen certain things that we would like to talk about. And uh, along with the description or the talks on textiles, Mr. Sengupta will take you through a trail where you can actually uh, physically go and visit these clusters or actually see the weave for yourself in its purest forms. Now, uh, when we talk about Indian textiles, like you can see the slide um, in, in front of you, that India is you know, known worldwide for its vibrant colors and textures and embroidery and designs. And our uh, fabric, textiles, our artifacts are appreciated globally. So here, we are not talking about crafts, we're not talking about artifacts in any other format, but we are simply concentrating on the textile trail of India, where we would uh, talk a little bit about West Bengal first, and then we will go into the certain states from the pair of the pairs provided in the Ek Bharat Sresh Bharat format. So, of course, uh, we know that from the from across the country, north to south and east to west, every region, every community, every tribe, every section has a different stylization of weave and different style of textile that they want to talk about or that they wear to represent their culture, their thought processes, their own lifestyles. So, and um, these textiles have been there in India for a very long time. And it is right now, for the last few years, it's traveling globally through, you know, uh, the works of our uh, designers who have international acclaim. And recently, Indian textiles have been really big on the international ramps. So uh, this is, of course, the map of India. And we would like to talk about certain zones that we would like to concentrate on at this moment. As you're talking, Sreya, that uh, Indian textile is coming back. It's really encouraging to see that textile is really coming back. But uh, if we uh, take the history a little behind, we'll see that it is the textile which uh, brought India into the world map. You probably know that at one point of time, 63% yes. of the total textile business of the world was uh, done by India and India's market. And this lucrative market brought in the foreigners. And as a result, uh, we also had to undergo the tremendous time for about 200 years under the foreign rules. And it all started from three major things, the spices and condiments, the gems and jewelries, and the textile. So if we leave these three out, then India would have probably never been attacked by the foreigners and we would have never been uh, dependent on others. Now it's we are, almost uh, like a poetic on... justice that uh, on the occasion of the 75th Indi Indian independence, we're celebrating textile. Absolutely. Absolutely. I agree with you. And so when we talk about Indian uh, textile, 
we can go to every Indian district and we'll find something new. <laughs> but uh, for our facility as a tourist uh, operation, operation business, people generally divide India. Government of India also divided the whole of India into five zones, the east, northeast, north, central, and south. So we will be also covering these areas. But our highlight is uh, Bengal today. Maybe another day we will come with more highlights on other places of India. So it would take uh, many sessions to actually talk about the textiles of the whole of India. I am with you completely. So now you can uh, go for the next uh, slide. Then about textile tours in India, we can uh, divide the textile tours in uh, five different ways. One is a pure academic tours. The people who are interested in knowing about textile because the whole world the handloom is a lost art. It is trying to be revived in different part of the world and where they find the ancient tradition, India. So a lot of people, researchers and academics, they are coming to India just to understand how we uh, preserved our heritage. You know, you will talk about uh, Muslim probably, that how it came back. So similar academic interest tours can be organized by uh, specialist people and there are also group of tours which we say about workshops people come here to learn one technique or the other maybe somebody is interested in just block printing going to jaipur i think many groups come to jaipur to learn the block prints or come to bengal to learn spinning because bengal is the finest spinners then there are people who ex try to explore things as it is and so they go to the villages and this we call the exploration tours. So they explore not just textile, but anything and everything that relates with textile. Also heritage tours. We talk about heritage. We have huge number of buildings on the uh, different part of India. Some are in the very remote areas. People are not even aware of these kind of heritage places where traditionally used for a textile promotion thing. And we will come to that uh, discussion later on. So we will talk about heritage with textile, other crafts, and many other uh, branches of culture. And obviously, last but not the least is the shopping tours. As you were talking, that people come, now they are getting interested in buying Indian fabrics and Indian designers are using Indian fabrics. So that is another way. So in this way, we will try to explore this country of textiles. Over to you, uh, um, Surya. Yeah, before we move on with the rest of the presentation and our little tour through the textile formats of India, we would like to remind our viewers that this is also a quiz session. So uh, somewhere in between, we would provide you with certain questions which have multiple choice answers. So please. Uh, Type your answers in the chat box and send it to us. The first ones to provide us with the correct answer would be eligible for the prize. So please keep your eyes and ears open throughout the presentation. So um, like uh, Shubham Korda and uh, I, I myself explained that we would like to concentrate a little bit on West Bengal because uh, West Bengal it, 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 it's, uh, we have just chosen West Bengal as a, as, as a part because right now West Bengal has the largest concentration of the variety of weaves that are provided. And like Shubham Korda uh, right now mentioned that we, uh, West Bengal spinners are the finest in the country, one of the finest in the country. So uh, the textile legacy of West Bengal travels throughout the state in different districts in different formats. Uh, I, myself, both Shubham Pardha and myself, we're talking from Calcutta, so we are quite, quite accustomed with the kind of uh, textile legacies that are there in this state. And uh, if this is a trail that uh, Shubham Pardha would like to describe a little? Uh, before uh, going to the trail, look at the map, please. I, I in, uh, invite your attention to this map where all the arrows start from Kolkata because Kolkata is the hub of a textile tours. And we can lead tours from Kolkata to Odisha, to Jharkhand, to Bihar,
to Assam and the entire northeastern India. So the different varieties of textiles Shreya will uh, inform us about. We will see how we can actually make our program in such a convenient way that we can cover most of the uh, textile forms and designs in as one or two different trips. So the next uh, slide we will see uh, the inspiration that the textile gets. And I think Shreya will uh, like to comment on this uh, influences of temples and textile. Uh, see, when a craft form or any other um, art form grows, it grows from the need of the people to provide them with sustenance. And later on, after ages, it transforms itself into a craft or a luxurious art form. And these influences, the motive influences and the, the importance of any kind of craft arrives or are especially a derived from what people of that cluster or, or that particular region see around themselves. So as and when we proceed through the presentation, you would see that um, many of these textiles all over India, not only uh, from Bengal, have taken references from um, the tangible heritage uh, perspective of the region or the flora and the fauna of the region. Or even there are certain cultural inputs that are there. Um, the textile of Bengal ranges from very rich embroidered heavy uh, textiles and also to very lighter fabrics. And I'm sure that textile does not only mean fabric, everything that is woven on loo can fall under this category, but we would just particularly concentrate on fabric in this presentation. So we would like to start with the Baluchori, the one of the most famous weaves of uh, Bengal. You see, Baluchori is uh, like, we would like to say it's more most ornate of the saris or the textiles that are woven in Bengal. It is woven in the Murshidabad district and the legacy can be traced back to the 18th century when Murshid Kuli Khan, the Nawab, he shifted his capital from uh, Dhaka to the banks of Bhagirathi, where Murshidabad was, uh, you know, established, or the settlement of Murshidabad came into being. The Baluchori sharis, or uh, the saris, are the, you know, they're most famous for the intricacies and designs. So um, the designs take references from their social structure from uh, flora fauna and also from temples which we will come to later because Baluchori saris can be found in two districts currently one is Murshidabad and one is Bakura which we will go to later on so here you can see that one of these motives is of the arrival of the Nawab in the in the region so through textiles and through um, you know, such art forms or such craft forms, there's also a social narrative that is constantly being presented to the people. It is not just ornamentation. It is not just, you know, certain borders, certain motives, certain calculations. It's, it's not about the graph. It is about what the people want to talk about, uh, their histories and their societies and their lineage. So as and when we talk about these fabrics, these weaves, you will see how people have been talking about their lineage and where they come from. So like I said, Baluchori is one of the most intricately uh, woven saris, as you can see. It is a silk, of course, with uh, zari and colored thread intricacies all over the sari. The, the importance of the Baluchori shari lies in the fact that it has very ornate borders and a pallu. And the pallus are not just design pallus like I was explaining right now. The Pallus narrate a story. These stories could be from the temples. These stories could be from the reign of the Nawabs. These stories sometimes are also from epics and mythology, right? You can see this uh, slide here is a part of the Baluchori Sari that talks about the Mahabharata. And there are also references of the Ramayana and uh, Menka and Vishwamitra in, in these two slides. And of course, their most important uh, legacy is the legacy of Nawabs that is there in Murshidabad. So the intricacy and the weave, of course, follows a pattern. And you would see that these uh, designs are formed in blocks. The blocks, the kind of blocks that you could find in the temple uh, motives or the temple tiles of Bengal. 
So this is a very strange milieu of, you know, uh, little references of the Nawabi culture, the format of the temple ties, and also of mythology, like we spoke. And now, without going into much of the details, because we have to cover a lot, just giving you a basic idea of um, the kind of Baluchori saris that are woven. Baluchori is an overall uh, name of the saris that is woven in Baluchor village near the Bhagirathi river. Now, there are distinctions between the type of saris based on the kind of thread, the kind of designs, the kind of motifs that are used. The two prominent distinctions that are there are the Meenakari and the Swarnachari. The Meenakari sari, like you know, if, if uh, you are from India and you have seen your mother's, your grandmother's jewelries, you know what Meenakari is. Meenakari is when you uh, embellish something with color. You know, you engrave something with color. So in the Meenakari sari, colored threads are used to, you know, uh, you know, bring out the design, to bring out motives, bring out uh, forms of uh, animals, human forms, even, even you know, different uh, floral patterns. And the Swarnachari has a regular weave, very intricate, but a regular golden weave. Swarnachari saris are generally uh, woven just with a golden thread. Initially, during the times of the Nawabs, these, these golden threads were actually gold. Now, these are saris. But that transition has happened, of course, due to uh, the rising price of gold and also because it has to be affordable for the regular people. So these are the two distinct categories of the Baluchari sari. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, talking about Murshidabad, and uh, we spoke about the legacy of the Nawabs, I think uh, Shubhangarda would be able to give you a much better insight into the history and the cultural aspect of Murshidabad. Over to you. Shreya, you were talking about the, the Nawab shifting the capital from Dhaka to uh, Murshidabad. In, in fact, the, the word Murshidabad comes from Murshid Kuli Khan himself. So he named the town after himself. And... Uh, to complement that, he made another town called Azim Ganj, just across the river. And because he wanted to please, or rather he wanted to avoid the conflict with the crown prince of the Mughal Empire at the time. We were actually talking about a time when Bengal was pivotal in Indian politics. Bengal was the highest revenue generating part of India, and hence it was actually financing the Mughal Empire. And you know, when Aurangzeb, uh, at, at, it, at the end of his career, he was mostly dependent on his, not on his sons. Ajimu's son was his uh, eldest son, but he was most dependent on Murshid Kuli Khan, mm -hmm. because Murshid Kuli Khan is a title given by Aurangzeb himself to Murshid Kuli Khan, to uh, a gentleman who served the Mughals in different part of India, in Maharashtra, in uh, in the southern uh, sojourn or in the southern attack conquest of the Mughals, it was Murshid Kuli Khan who helped uh, the uh, Emperor Aurangzeb, and hence Aurangzeb was heavily dependent on Murshid Kuli Khan. But uh, the Crown Prince was Nawab Azimus son. And so there was uh, always a chance of conflict between the two. This is why Mushid Kuli Khan proposed to move the revenue capital, not the real capital of Bengal, the revenue capital to Murshidabad. Murshidabad. It's like the financial capital of India is now Mumbai. So similarly, at that time, the financial capital was moved to uh, Murshidabad. And as he moved, there's another interesting story I'm sure you know about it, is that the Baluchar, why Baluchar was chosen and why the Baluchari Sari came in, it's because of the decline of Maslin hmm. under Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb, you know the story of how Aurangzeb destroyed the art of Maslin weaving. Art of Maslin. And so they needed to have a complementary. Maslin was a very uh, sophisticated and very highly uh, you know, pr prized possession. And so to complement the loss of Maslin, there was a need to bring a new thing. And Baluchar was the name of the village, which you will not find today. The Baluchar village is now somewhere in Jiaganj area, 
and uh, in Murshidabad, which is uh, approximately about 10 kilometers from the town of Murshidabad. Mm. And you can see in the uh, slide, the palace, Hazadwari Palace, was built much, much, much later than the Baluchar. So Baluchar is sorry, predates the Hazadwari Palace. Though it is now the principal attraction of Murshidabad, Hazadwari Palace and other palaces, there are many palaces in uh, Murshidabad. And a tour of a full day can take people to different palaces like the Kadgola Palace, like the Nasipur Palace, like the uh, <clears throat> Kashim Bazar Palace, and also the later on or in the other side of the river, the Azim Ganj area, all the Jain palaces, the bankers. It attracted bankers from G Rajasthan and Gujarat to come and settle in Bengal at that time in the early 18th century. So it's really become like a, a great commercial center. And in today's time, it actually gives a very somber reminder of the old and golden days. If we move to the next slide, then we can see. Uh, just a little trivia for our viewers. If you're looking for some magic in Hajardwari Palace, there is a mirror where you can see your body, but not your face. Go and try it out. That, that is the earliest uh, spy cam, we say, that you can see yourself. But it, anyway, we will see in Mushidabad, during this period of time, three distinct cultures arrived and moved at the same time. The Religiously, it was the Islam, the Jainism, and the Hinduism all moved together. And Mushidabad is one place, if you are interested in architecture, you must visit Mushidabad because only in Mushidabad you can see a very typical Bengali style of temple architecture, which the architects or the experts classify as the Mushidabad style of Bengal terracotta. You can see that Pratapeshwar temple in uh, Baranagar, which is more known for its terracotta uh, temples, but those kind of temples you can see elsewhere, not the Mushidabad style. And then you can see the Katra Mosque, which was one of the largest mosques at the time. A very interesting uh, place to be. You can ride a Tonga and take a horse cart ride and just move around into that uh, era of the Dawabs. And you can relax yourself in the palaces and in the uh, inner chambers of the royal palaces. So give yourself that royalty and then move into that Baluchar village, which today is Jad Tantipara in Jiaganj. And you can go there and then walk with the weavers. Another thing I'm sure, Shreya, you know, that uh, the Baluchari saris were originally not done in the jacquard loom. But now you won't see the, them doing it exactly. with the jali. Uh, with the jali. You say you call it jali, right? Yeah. But you don't you don't see them doing it in jali. They only do it in jacquard. Jacquard. And, uh, but some of the people in that Chiaganj village, in the Baluchar village, they're trying to revive that original uh, weaving style. Whereas when you talk about Balucharis, everybody in India, they talk about Vishnupur. How hmm. Balucharis traveled to Vishnupur is another story, which we will talk when we talk about Vishnupur. About Vishnupur. So, yes. Uh, so, so Shubhangarda, once we're talking about Murshidabad, so there's another very important uh, weave of Murshidabad that Bengalis are famous for, you know, everywhere all over India, Bengalis are known by, um, you know, the Gorod Sharis. We will come to the Gorod, we'll go through the uh, Gorod part a little bit. Before that, for the viewers, this is your first question. What is the name of the Nawab who shifted his capital from Dhaka to West Bengal? These are your options. Please uh, note down the correct option and uh, provide us with your answers in the chat box. And those who give the uh, correct answers wins the, rewards. The, the first, the the first ones, the earliest correct answer providers would be eligible for the prizes. And this is your second question. What is the speciality of the Swarnachari Sari? I hope all of you have got your questions and the answers uh, noted. So we would move on to the next kind of weave that we were talking about. 
Uh, if we talk about uh, Murshidabad, there is one thing that we cannot leave out, and especially as Bengalis. If you look at the sari, you would see that Bengalis all over are characterized by this uh, particular weave, which is the red bordered white sari in Bengal. We call it Lal Par Shada Shari. Par means border. Now, the original Lal Par Shada Shari was, is generally used in pujas because, of course, white is considered to be pious. The Gorod Sharis are named Gorod because uh, Gorod means white and the yarn, the silk, is kept un, uh, undyed. This is the actual color of the silk with which the saris are woven. Of course, the borders are often red or maroon and zari work. Initially, gold was woven, but uh, right now zari is woven. And uh, a variety of designs can be found right now on the Gaurav Shari where you can see the Paisley design is one of the most popular designs in this weave. And of course, the flora and the fauna of the region. Uh, there are two categories of Garod. Uh, one is the sari that I showed here, which is more intricately woven with an ornate border. And the another part of uh, Garod is the Korai. Korai is more simple, but it has the same feel of the Garod where there is a flat red border. And of course, the body is white. And why I'm saying that Bengalis are famous is if you have um, from all over India, if you have looked at the pictures of Durga Puja or have visited Kolkata or Bengal during Durga Puja, you would see women wearing these saris everywhere. So this is like the quintessential attire for religious ceremonies in Bengal, which has been also popularized by Bollywood because any, any representation of a Bengali in Bollywood would wear this sari. So this was it about Murshidabad. Uh, we would uh, just because we have to uh, run through so many textile formats, we would just go to another district of Bengal, which is Birbhum. We will start talking about Birbhum with a very special and interesting weave. Um, Shubhamurda, I don't know if you will agree that Kesh is one of the most interesting weave formats where you know the process of upcycling is more important than the actual weaving format. Absolutely. I think this is very uh, uh, specialty of Bengal that we think everything is recyclable and that yeah. recycling starts from here. So um, why are we calling it upcycling is because uh, there is a lot of fabric wastage through consumption. Once a, a garment is torn, a garment gets old, we discard it, we burn it. So. Uh, Apparently, during 1920s, under the patronage of Rabindranath Tagore, they developed a format of weaving which would in involve the wasted saris and use them as the weft yarn. If you look at the bigger picture in the slide, you would see that there is a texture in the sari. A, a part of the sari is flat. Another part is a little corrugated with a warped uh, you know, pattern. Those warps are actually inserted strips of older saris. Now, in the inset, of course, you can see a person tearing or stripping the saris. So uh, what happened was sari was generally cotton, you know, in, in villages or in those areas, in districts. Synthetic was not, it's still not very popular, but initially it was definitely not very popular. So once those saris got a burn mark or a tear or even stains, they would be discarded and used as pocha or something like that. So you know, what could be the way to revive these saris and make them usable, you know, you know, keep them, keep on using them as a format of non-waste fashion. It, we are very popular with the non-waste, zero-waste fashion concept these days, but this probably was one of the first ideals of zero-waste fashion. So these saris, the technicality, I'll just go into the technicality a little bit. Uh, these saris are stripped into very thin strips and uh, they're rolled and put inside the weft yarn. The, the warp yarn is thread, cotton thread, and they have amazing texture. If you see the next slide, you see, if, if you visit Shantiniketan in uh, Birbhum, you will see that the Shantiniketan right now is overflowing with these, uh, these uh, yardages, these textiles. And if you look into the the pictures here, you would see how interesting the pattern comes. You know, it is like a corrugated sheet 
but this is a yard which is very uh, yardage which is very soft it can be transferred into you know depending on the coarseness or the thickness of the weave it can be transferred into uh, tapestry household items apparels and you know so the whole idea of not wasting fabric or not wasting resources and upcycling resources into giving them longevity through another medium is what kesh is really really you know interesting makes kesh interesting and uh, continuing with the same idea of upcycling and recycling from the same district fortunately is the katha of birbhum if anybody is a textile enthusiast among our viewers you would know katha is a very ornately intricately designed embroidery format that comes from bengal but originally we bengalis or somebody who lives around that region we have seen our grandmothers uh, you know provide us with quilts that were actual katha so katha comes from the whole idea of recycling old sarees again kesh was woven katha is stitched so what happens is when a sari is discarded when a when a fabric is discarded they layer up three four five layers and they're tucked together with run stitches and these stitches formed quilts like these so the one on your extreme left is a simpler format of katha and the one on the right is the more ornate um representation of the katha which is also a quilt but these are called shujnis now when a craft form evolves decoration happens right so um the women katha is mainly a women centric uh, art form so the women of uh, households all over bengal and I'm, I'm, i'm talking about undivided bengal here all over bengal started stitching katha and narrating their stories this was almost like a getaway for the women where they would narrate about the things that they went through the social structure the flora fauna every design every design that you can at least see here is is from either a flower they see or a leaf they see or as you can see the border is the border of the sari and the rest of it is the white uh sari and interestingly traditionally hundreds of years ago katha was stitched with the threads taken out from the woven borders of the sari no additional thread was used if you look into the next uh slide these are snapshots from a uh, 200 300 year old katha work from a folk museum in kolkata called the gurusadai museum these uh, come from um undivided bengal from maiman singh and uh, around what is now in bangladesh you can see that you know women there had uh, you know tried to narrate things tried to talk about things in these tapestries these are in form of tapestries there are different kinds of katha but we would not go into that right now the usages were varied and the names are varied but this is too short of a time to go in there but you see that there's this uh, british regiment and there's this tazia that's being pulled in and also a narrative about what's uh, what was happening around them so women doing household chores or a man being pampered by a woman so all these narratives all these images came out as 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 stories in these uh, embroidery formats and currently that legacy is continued all over bengal and there is a huge concentration of katha weavers katha embroiderers rather in birbhum so all over birbhum during um, especially i'm sorry uh, around the shantiniketan area in and out of shantiniketan there is a typical katha village closer to shantiniketan called nanur they have continued with that storytelling legacy so this katha right now that you're seeing is a is a tapestry or a shawl whichever way you want to use it it is a narrative of a village scene so these are called golpo katha golpo means stories literally so these are kathas that narrate the stories of the village narrate the stories of the livelihood of the people and uh, very interestingly like like i was uh, telling you these narratives come from different aspects in and around the area the inset picture is of a terracotta temple that you will find in the birbhum area 
terracotta temples are strewn all along the Ilam Bazar area close to Shantiniketan and also there is a very interesting terracotta temple in Nanur itself. If you see that the flower motifs, the foliage have some direct reference to the terracotta tiles of these temples. It is not only in form of Baluchuri but also in form of Katha where temple architecture has been taken into consideration while weaving tapestry. And uh, when we go into the Indian section, Shubhamburda, we will also find that there are other weave formats which also refer to temple architecture and the visuals from temple architectures. So see how the foliage, the borders of these terracotta temples and the, and the foliage patterns have been adapted by the Katha artists and they are used as, you know, design formats, which people, I mean, most of the people who consume these items or acquire these items do not try to find the connection between the, the, you know, the references and the product. But here, since we're talking about the legacy of certain textiles, we would request the, the viewers to actually look into the references that help build a product. You know, product is not just about design. Designs don't come from uh, a pen and a paper. Designs have, you know, certain things leave an imprint in our minds. So it would be great if we could find the source of those imprints. So these are the imprints that we're right now talking about along with the legacy of the, you know, uh, the textile itself. Shubhankoda, over to you and if you see, want to talk a little about you're talking people. about the legacy and the connection between them two. Uh, <clears throat> I was just thinking that, look, uh, in the ancient India, in the ancient times, there were stone sculptures or the terracotta sculptures. And there was also tapestries and textiles, but we do not have uh, much of the textile preserved. And so how do these artisans or the uh, weavers or the embroiderers keep their traditions? So sometimes it comes to my mind, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it's a vice versa, it's a taking and giving. It so is. The, the embroiderer given new motifs to the sculptors, the sculptors came back and uh, petra, uh, petrified it on a stone or made it into a terracotta panel. And then it, the next generation of weavers are influenced by those panels. So here you, you were talking about Birbhum. In Birbhum, almost every uh, block has its own specialty uh, textile. You know that you can, one can actually travel in Euro, in Birbhum for more than two weeks and yeah. yet not get bored because he can get uh, new things every now and then. So from Nanur, when you get the reference of Nanur, Nanur is associated with the famous uh, poet, Chandidas, Chandidas, who represent the transition time of the origin of Bengali language. So the, when the Bengali language was evolved from Vidyapati's, uh, you know, Brajavasha into Bengali. So Chandidas is among the first generation of those. So the temple, preserved the ideas and the time of Chandidas, which is about 10th to 12th century. And those temple motifs when they are taken by the upcyclers in Kesh or in Kantha, what they are actually doing, they are carrying the legacy, which was there for time immemorial. And so the next slide, we will see some more things that one can explore in Shantiniketan, as you mentioned about Shantiniketan, when you talk about Birbhum, basically people talk about Shanti Niketan because in one word, if I have to describe Shanti Niketan, I would say this is the cultural epicenter of India's 19th century. Under the patronage of Rabindranath Tagore, Shanti Niketan showed the way to India, not just preserving the heritage, but also interfering positively into the uh, preservation and progress of one expression of art to another because cultural expressions are interchanging. Here you can see this beautiful uh, painting on the black house by the famous KG Subramaniam, or we used to call KG Da, so Manida. This KG Subramaniam drawn this building, and those who are interested in the textile design they actually learn textile design in this building. 
in this building was also the residence of, for some time of the famous filmmaker Satyajit Ray. And so the reference of Satyajit Ray with Shantiniketan and the next sculpture, you see the sculpture here? This is ca called the Koler Banshi, a uh, famous mm. sculpture by Ram King Corbej. It's on concrete. This is the first time in anywhere in the world people tried concrete to be used as a material of art. And Ram King Corbej was directly influenced by Rabindranath Tagore in experimenting in this kind of art. There are fantastic stories about Ram King Corbej's sculptures. And the yellow building on the top is called Shanti Niketan building. Shanti Niketan was originally planned by Rabindranath Tagore as an, a place for meditation and his, uh, you know, long departure from the cacophony of Calcutta city. But later, his grandson, Balenunath Tagore, was uh, given charge to start a small school, mainly for the Brahma Samaj uh, enthusiasts. But at the untime death of Balenunath Tagore, this school came in the hand of Rabindranath. And there is the turning point. From there, Shantiniketan developed into the first open air university, which tried to make a fusion of the ancient Indian uh, ashramic institution with the modern education system. So, Rabindranath Tagore believed in a universalization of uh, universalization of the culture, and he tried every segment of culture. So, Shantiniketan is can be visited from textile angle, from sculpture, from painting, from music, from dance. In the next slide, you'll see some more activities around Shantiniketan. Look at the singer on the river, Ajay River, which is uh, full in the month of uh, <clears throat> July, August. And the Baul singers, those who have heard of this word Baul before, will know that this is a soulful music. Though originally they are wandering musicians, but Shantiniketan becomes a very uh, hub for this kind of musicians because of its association with the birthplace of Kabi Jayadev, another ancient Bengali poet, the composer of Gita Govindam. And uh, the Baul singers with the dancers, Rabindranath Tagore experimented with different form of dance. India has many dance forms. That can be another uh, webinar on dances. Rabindranath Tagore tried to bring the different forms and tried to find out a new expression for a modern India, which is rooted in the ancient wisdom and winged for the movement towards the progressive future. So you can see that uh, batik print, you probably men, uh, mentioned some point of time, the batik print, which is also done in clothes or fabrics, here you can see it in the leather. And then the Santal tribal painting on their oval. It's uh, around Shantiniketan, there are tribal villages, mostly inhabited by the Santal people. And they are very well known for their art and sculptures. Their houses are beautifully decorated. And uh, the musicians, uh, Shantali musicians are also great composers and players. So we can see all these things. Shantiniketan can be the real hub from where if someone bathes and then explore all the neighboring villages for textile, terracotta, kantha, and all kinds of art forms, music and dance altogether. Over to the next one, please. So uh, the next is the question for you in this section. What was kantha originally used for? Please write down the correct option in the chat box and uh, we will process your answers and select you for the gifts. Do they have to write the whole answer or just the A, B, C options? I think the whole answer would be good. All the answers would be good, yes. So you have to write the whole answer with your options. And this is the second question for this section. In which district of West Bengal do we find the most concentration of Katha artists? So I sincerely hope you remember the name of the district. So 
So moving on to the next, um, I spoke about Bengal having a variety of textiles, you know, from heavily brocaded, embroidered, embellished uh, textiles to very lightweight saris. So this is one of the kind that we're talking about. This kind is found over two districts of Bengal. We're talking about one district and then we will uh, move to another in a short while. This is the Taat. Taat is the quintessential Bengali cotton sari with an ornate border. So if anybody has Bengali acquaintances, especially if you are younger, you have seen the mothers of your friends and you know acquaintances wear these um, woven cotton saris that are very, uh, very uh, light and breezy and they're ideal for summer. So the first uh, zone in Bengal that weaves magnificent taat. Taat again is the direct translation of a loom in Bengali. So taat saris is something that is woven on a hand loom, simply hand loom saris. So um, we're talking about taat in Nodia. Now uh, Nodia is one of the districts that makes, of course, the best of the taats, and the the pulia taat is one of the most popular Taat saris of Bengal, along with the others that we will talk about right now. Now, Pulia in Shantipur in Nodia makes uh, these ornate and woven textured saris that comes in forms of designs. The designs that you see are not embroideries. These are woven in the through the weft. And the main format of these saris are they're very brightly colored. They come with... Uh, you know, very contrasting borders and sometimes sari is woven into the border. And of course, through specializations and through modifications, the Dhakai tradition, the Dhakai Jamdani tradition of Bangladesh is also being replicated through the formats of this week. So the inset that you see is kind of uh, an inspiration from the Dhakai that Pulia is weaving as on date. I'm sorry if uh, you know I'm rushing through these things because all these textiles have a lot of things that uh, people should know about, but we have time constraints. So right, you can see there the brightly colored saris come with different design formats like booties or small dots along the body and very heavily ornated decorated borders. Now the blue sari that you can see has a, a foliage pattern in zari. Sometimes the, the more expensive saris are woven, of course, in zari and the heavier ones, like the party wear ones. And the regular saris that are woven by uh, the worn by the women for, you know, daily wear, these, the embroidery or the weaves are done in contrasting threads. And the red sari that you can see is the modernization, okay. modernized format of the Pulia or the Shantipuri Shari, where people are moving in from the traditional formats and adapting more, you know, contemporary designs in terms of motifs, in terms of flat borders. You see references of different, you know, uh, traditions, different design formats, like in temples. You know, the temples on the border and the flat border have a direct re reference to the Kanjivaram down south, but this is in cotton and Kanjivaram is, of course, in gold and silk. So this is uh, a very, very uh, important part of Bengal. This is, uh, I don't know if, if uh, anybody will agree with me, one of the most popular saris in Bengal that people consume for their daily use. You know, baluchari's and mugas and tassars, these are consumed for special occasions. But every Bengali, Bengalis who wear saris have, uh, you, know, you know, these in the closet. The one I'm wearing right now is, one of the modernized version, versions of the Shantipuri sari, which have no designs. It has no designs. It is just a flat weave. So these modifications are happening to keep up with the market. But what we are talking about here is the kind of traditional saris, the traditional textile rather, that was woven by these clusters. So uh, we, of when course, we talk about uh, uh, Nadia. Nadia is another very attractive district to visit, even without textile. But, uh, you know, it was the ancient uh, estuary of the river Ganga and was the birthplace of one of the most illuminous Bengali ever, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. 
So Nadia or Nabadweep, as we also call a town in Nadia district is also called Nabadweep, used to be the capital of Bengal at some point of time due to the shift of the river. The, the topography of Nadia and Nabadweep changed. It is either, these are no more uh, nine islands, but at one point of time, there was a congregation of nine islands in one place. But uh, Nabadweep situated in, uh, a, in a crossing of two rivers, Jolongi and uh, what we call Ganga is officially named as the Hugli or Bhagirathi. Now, it is a connector between uh, Ganga and the Padma. On this bank, there are uh, several islands and each island is in very much uh, known for its different kind of textile weaving as well as different kind of art form. Like Krishnagar is famous for the dolls, the clay dolls. And uh, now if I take people for a tour in Nabadvi, I will not only uh, visit these places, but also go to the house where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was born. And what you see, Sriya, you must have been there several times to see the famous gamchas being uh, yeah. open in Navadri. And yes. uh, gamchas are scarves, so you will explain later on sometimes. And Shantipuri, we're talking about. Shantipur is famous as a Vaishnavite place, was the birthplace of two great saints. One was Advaita Acharya, the, the teacher or the initiator of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And the second one was the composer of Bengali Ramayana, Kritivas. So it is actually the place where the Bengali Ramayana was born. And so there is no doubt that Ramayana will influence the motifs of the saris designed here. Another very important and uh, new destination is coming in Nabadweep, which you can see in the left uh, top corner is the Iskon temple, Chandradaya temple. They are calling it a Vedic planetarium is in the making. And it is going to be the largest Hindu temple in the subcontinent when it is finished. So this is uh, complete being uh, built now and on the bank of the river Bhagirathi or Ganga. On the other side of the bank river are the Nabadweep town, which is also especially known for uh, the weaving and various kinds of textiles. And also dyeing. You probably uh, talk about natural dye at some point of time. Yes, so Nabadip yes. is a one place where the natural dye is uh, being practiced. A small area in this uh, Nabadip has been identified to reintroduce indigo mm -hmm. as a natural dye. You know, indigo was a uh, big part of Indian history in the early 19th century when Indigo was cultivated all over Bengal forcefully by the British masters in order to use it for the textile dye and other things, uh, mostly for textile dye. And so the Bengali farmers had to starve and they had to revolt, which is known as the Indigo Revolution of the early 8th, 19th century. Finally, the Indigo had to go. Mm. In the, I think you will know what time, probably in the late uh, 19th century, the German scientists discovered the uh, chemical indigo and then the natural indigo started uh, losing its market and we got back our uh, crops. But mm. now indigo is coming back not as an essential uh, object but as an experimental uh, object for textile dye mm. for in this region. So that is another information those who are interested in going to Nabadweep it is a very easy accessible from Calcutta, just 120 kilometer. It can you can drive in there in the morning, visit the places, and come back to the city by the evening. So the and next uh, slide. Since we're talking about uh, the dyeing tradition of uh, Shantipur, uh, it is also you know very distinct that uh, Shantipur is one of the major suppliers of dyed yarns to the rest of Bengal, mainly yes. cotton dyed yarns. Absolutely, absolutely. And there are many artists who are actually yeah. practicing this art. So now, exactly. <clears throat> so we continue with handloom. Uh, we're coming to the next uh, district of Hooghly, where handloom uh, flourishes as Begampur and Dhaniakali saris. 
Now, Begampur and Dhaniakali are a little richer in terms of texture, in terms of uh, its weight than the Taat of Nadia. And regularly, they're not, they're, they're not uh, household wares. So if you see the designs, you would understand this is a Begampuri, right? So the borders are really heavy. And there is a lot of floral and geometric and zigzag lines that come together as a cluster to form the whole format of a sari. If you see the inset, there is a very heavy decoration of flowers and, you know, uh, you know, insets and solid blocks of flowers with lines of flowers all along the body. So the Begampuri sari is very important in terms of design, I would say, rather than the taat of Nudia. More ornate and, uh, you know, caters better to the younger crowd, I would say, because uh, the Taat of Nodia is more traditional and the Taat of Nodia is starched. So once, if you, if you wear a new sari, it is very heavily starched and stiff. It needs a couple of washes before it actually becomes soft. The Begum Puri and the Dhaniakali that we're talking about are actually very soft uh, cottons that have beautifully woven uh, pallus and borders and even there is a there is an intricacy all along the body so it's almost like a mesh that covers you and this is the dhania khali the dhania khali is characterized by very heavy weaves and the speciality of the dhania khali is that it is a little more coarser and heavier than the bigampuri and it has a um, very prominent present of triangles and uh, you know uh, rhombus shapes, mainly geometry that is placed in strips all over the body. And one of the main, main motifs that Dhania Kali is really, really famous for is the fish. So if you find these kinds of motifs, which is also being adapted by different weavers, not necessarily the Dhania Kali weavers right now, because this is global. Uh, you know, everybody knows what the other person is doing. Mm -hmm. But traditionally, these kind of designs characterize the dhania khali sari. You see that this, this particular fish is very typical. It comes in different colors, different position placements all along the pallu or the body. And there are, of course, uh, you know, different, different formats in which this, these fish are presented. But of course, this is a typicality of the hoogli taat area. Uh, when you talk about Hooghly, Hooghly is relatively a new place in uh, in Bengal because you see the river called Hooghly and this place is called Hooghly. And it's very interesting how the river can be called Hooghly. I would rather say that uh, Hooghly should not be the name of the river because the old Bengali word Hooghly stands for a place which is uh, by the side of the river reclaimed for the purpose of living or agriculture. It is probably because of the Portuguese who Portuguese. reclaimed this banks of the river here and they established their first factory, a textile factory in Hooghly. So it becomes known as the Hooghly and the river they used from the Bay of Bengal to come here was called the river to Hooghly because there were so many branches of the Ganga, they could not identify the names, the local names. And so they started naming the rivers according to their convenience. And so the river to Hooghly later becomes River Hooghly. In the Hooghly, from Kolkata to Hooghly, this entire stretch we call an European expansion. Because you see, if I just name the, uh, the, the countries from where the traders came here, the viewers, the listeners will understand in one sentence how important textile is, how important it was, and how important it will remain. The Hooghly was first occupied by the Portuguese, followed by the Flemish, the Belge, the Dutch, the Swedish, the uh, French, and finally the British. So almost all of Europe was at one point of time present here. You can see and on the world right famous side. bandel cheese was also uh, produced here at one point yes. of time. Yes, and the people say that the Roshogolla, uh, sweet Roshogolla, Bengali Roshogolla, got the special kind of casein or the precipitation 
learned from the Portuguese how to do that, prepare that with the mm. old, uh, you know, way. So now you can see that the old uh, French church on the right uh, bottom, uh, right top corner, and in the middle is an imambara. This is a marvelous site of imambara built by uh, a famous uh, architect, sponsored by a famous philanthropist, Hazrat Muhammad Masin, yes. who also sponsored the once upon a time the largest school in the world, which was in the Guinness Book of Records. No more. Now it has reduced its size. <clears throat> so this uh, uh, Hugli area has an imambara, has the oldest Portuguese church, oldest church in Bengal uh, from the 1500, from the French church, the Dutch cemetery and the Dutch church, the Danish church of Sarampur, and a newly uh, restructured Danish tavern where people can go and have some of their, you know, Danish pastries. So all the old architecture, the colonial architecture, is a very important part of the district of Hugli. And with the colonial influence, or probably by the commissioning by the European companies, the textile form started changing. And so when you talk about Begampuri and Fulia, there was a time when we called the Farash Dangatat. You remember that? Yeah. Farash Danga, because the Farash comes from Farashi, or Farashi. French. The French uh, commissioned uh, tapestries or uh, textile fabrics. So the Portuguese fabrics, the Dutch fabrics, these were available in the various small uh, museums in that area, which is very interestingly uh, visited by a river cruise. There are plenty of river cruises available nowadays, and people can book one of the cruise and go past these areas. Or one can just travel by road from Calcutta, the farthest point of Hugli is about 70 kilometers, and so you can stop and visit the various European sites besides the textile. And it is still important that all the Dhaniakali Begampuri comes under the Hugli district. So you have to just do a little bit of uh, you know uh, mapping or googling to find your way, and you know every. 20, 25 minutes, you will come across a new style of textile if you are interested in textile. If you are not, then every half an hour, you'll see new colonial architecture, new design yeah. of architecture. And uh, also the famous uh, places associated with uh, Indian revolutionaries. One of them I should mention was uh, Kanai Lal Dotto, the mm. first uh, who was hanged in the Alipur Central Jail for the uh, by the British for his uh, attempt to uproot the British Empire from India. So this is the area, and Chandanagar is also famous as the, the final departure of Sri Aurobindo, which converts him from the revolutionary Aurobindo into Rishi Aurobindo. So it has a many different uh, aspects of visit, and it is also a day trip possible from Calcutta to all these places, so Bandel, Chandanagar, Chinsura and uh, Sarampur and visit this uh, textile at the same time. So uh, for people who point. like history uh, would be interested to know that the Bandal church still has the mast from the first ship that uh, came, you know, into the banks in the 16th century. Yes, that wrecked and that was a fantastic story. I don't want to <laughs> tell that story now because it will be another day. We will talk about that. Uh, anyway, so over to the next uh, and see what we have. Uh, next, we have the questions for the viewers. Uh, what are the names of the two types of saris woven in the Hooghly district of Bengal? And these are your options. Make sure to choose your correct option and write down the answers in the chat box as soon as possible because, uh, you know, there are so many viewers, and uh, we would like to select the first correct answer provider here. And next, we move on to a very interesting district. I'm sure Shubhankarda is uh, really excited to talk about this district. So I will not take too much time talking about the textile here, whereas textile is really, really important. Uh, at the beginning of our uh, Beng uh, Bengal section, we had spoken about Baluchoris, 
So this is where Baluchori migrated from Murshidabad. This is Birbhum, uh, sorry, Bakura. I'm sorry. So before we go into Baluchori, we would just talk about the Bishnupur silk. Bishnupur silk is another uh, very lightweight silk that is woven in Bakura in Bishnupur. Uh, this is one of the most uh, commonly used silks that are dyed, printed, <clears throat> on, embroidered, and they're extremely good quality. Now, the difference between the baluchori and the, uh, the, the kind of silk that I'm talking about right now is in the weight. Since baluchori is intricately woven with threads and Bishnupur silk is generally woven in as a flat yardage, you would find the softness varies. You know, Bishnupur silk is very soft once uh, it has been worn and it's been washed and processed. The silk actually provides you with a very a comfortable feel, unlike the gorgeous shari, saris that we wear for occasions. So in Bengali households, generally in Bengal, any regular sari wear would wear a Vishnupur silk while going out. They would not opt for a baluchori or not opt for a gorod, but a Vishnupur silk. Like you see, um, since these are flat weaves, there are many possibilities that can be, uh, you know, that that can make the Bishnupur silk adaptive to various kinds of markets. I have two uh, photographs here. One is printed. The most common and the most popular way of wearing a Bishnupur, Bishnupur silk is by printing it. So there are print houses, block printing houses that print over Bishnu, Bishnupur silk and make it available to the market. And of course, the flat colors are also very, uh, getting very popular with the youth these days. Now, coming on to the most precious silk weave of Bakura, like Murshidabad, is the Baluchori. Now, if uh, Shubham Kodda would actually mm -hmm. emphasize on the transition of Baluchori from Murshidabad to uh, Bakura, we would just uh, talk about the legacies a little later. Well, uh, you know, when... Uh the jolly weavers, the weavers who is to do all these intricate design by hand. It is very uh, tiresome and very intricate mathematical calculations, you know, as a specialist. But uh, <clears throat> with this art was getting less sponsors, so mm -hmm. it was dying. At that point of time, uh, some well uh, <clears throat> thought people like uh, Shubho Thakur of the Tagore family and many others, they tried to reintroduce the Baluchari, but they did not find the weavers and there was not uh, possible for um, to introduce the Jali system again because it takes too much a time and when it takes time, it increases the price of the commodity. And so mm. that, they, that is the main reason <clears throat> that they were losing their market. And at this time, they had to think out of the box. And so they brought in some specialists from uh, Varanasi who knew both the Jali work as well as the Jacquard loom. So they started using uh, Baluchari uh, production with the help of Jacquard loom, specially designed to suit the Baluchari options. So it, the transition came in the early 20th century, and now Bal Bishnupur becomes one with the Baluchari silk and the sari. There are over 100 weavers uh, living in Bishnupur who are producing it on a daily basis and using the jacquard, all, obviously, uh, not uh, completely by hand. So they're using the jacquard loom to make these intricate designs. And Bishnupur, as if I go to the next slides, we will know more is not only about the Baluchari, but also it's a craft center. It's a traditional craft center of Bengal, have many different kinds of crafts, like the spinning of the silk. Mm. Tassar, you have already mentioned. Cone shell carving is a very intricate work in Vishnupur. And so is the middle one on the left panel. You see the two horses have become yeah, almost the national symbol of handicrafts. So you'll see it is uh, taken as a emblem of the Central Cottage Industries Emporium. And so this is that Bishnupur horse. And it actually dates back to the very old pre-Aryan time. 
when mm. these horses were given as a votive uh, offerings to the mm. uh, you know folk deities and below that is uh, the dokra art dokra. which is a very very ancient technique of lost wax metal casting so these three are the major art in vishnupur and all these happened around a very small town of vishnupur planned by myself you know i planned the uh, vishnupur <laughs> actually the the town planner of vishnupur was also called shubhankar who was the descendant of vidyadha uh, whose descendant vidyadha bhattacharya became more famous because he was taken by raja man singh to uh, raja jay singh sorry to jaipur and planned the jaipur town mm. in rajasthan so the town planner of vishnupur was so much known in the uh, india at that time i'm talking about the 16th 17th century when they were invited to the other provinces other parts of india to design towns the town planning concept and vishnupur town planning is something really inconsiderable today is we it is very difficult to locate but we have found lot of archaeological things to understand the old town planning of vishnupur and you see this is a unique structure and the center <clears throat> which people generally call the pyramid is a rasa mancha it's not a temple it's a platform and it has 108 doorways and it is said that if you use this doorways you actually cross the path of a rasa mandala so rasa mandala it is therefore called the rasa mancha associated with the vaishnavite culture for which the town of vishnupur is so named besides this unique structure which is a pyramidic it's a pyramidic dome supported by only the vaulted arch that is bengal speciality you see the small arches which you can see in the sikandra in uh, fatehpur sikri in mm. other parts of india later on transferred into the stone especially uh, uh, it attracted raja man singh of jaipur and therefore he brought in with him the mogol emperors brought them with them and a lot of mogol buildings have adorned with this kind of slanted roof of bengal we call the chala so these chalas there are very uh, different kind of chalas and the pyramidic vault uh, which is making the vishnupur rasamancha a very unique strat, uh, structure besides this rasamancha we have plenty of terracotta temples i would like to move the next slide and you see it's like a you know a treat for your eyes you just think of any floral motif any mythological story and you find them in the bricks of or in the stones of vishnupur vishnupur has five distinctive style of bengal temple architecture of which two are represented here the ratna style and the chala style and then all the temples are very ornated by the panel works of bricks or stone a special kind of stone used in vishnupur temples called laterite makes it very difficult to carve but the artist did it very well and from this uh, sculptures also the textile was inspired so vishnupur is a temple town which was uh, which can be actually regarded as a world heritage site unfortunately it is not uh, designated as a world heritage it's a town of hundreds of temples and uh, wind towers and the palace broken palace almost and uh, the town planning itself is very interesting so if you go to vishnupur those who are going to vishnupur a trip to vishnupur can be made in one night tour from calcutta if you are driving through the district of hugli visiting all the textiles and also en route visit the two important places the birth place of sri ramakrishna paramhamsa at kamarpukur and the birth place of uh, ma sarada at jairambati so if you can visit that vishnupur it will be like a pilgrimage of both spiritualism and art and technology so vishnupur is really unique so over to the next and we will see more about that 
So what we talked about in this uh, previous slide, we actually talked about a general circuit of a complete textile tour of Bengal, which I think can be replicated in the other part of India. If we do like look at the map, we start from Kolkata, then go upward north to Shantipur and then to Krishnanagar, which is Navadip area, and then move farther up to Murshidabad. From Murshidabad, we start coming uh, to the west, going to Birghum, then farther southwest to Shantiniketan, and then farther west to Bankura, then farther south to Hooghly, and from Hooghly, we come back to Kolkata. So all the places that all the textile styles, traditions, and techniques that Shreya has just mentioned are available in this blue line. If you make a journey, it will be about a 700 kilometer journey altogether can be covered in five, seven, nine days, or even more, depending on how you are interested in uh, uh, exploring the different craft and different cultural styles or the monuments. So this is a unique uh, circuit, West Bengal textile tour circuit has been becoming very, very popular. In the last five, six years, I am doing a lot of textile tours in Bengal because people, in, especially in Europe and in Australia, they are getting much interested in exploring the textile possibilities and also the heritage associated with it. And so the Bengal textile tour circuit can be replicated for the other uh, states as well. And I have done this kind of circuits in Gujarat in Rajasthan, Maharashtra and Goa can be done in the whole of South of India or mm -hmm. a separate circuit for the Northeastern India. So we can move on to that later on as the time comes on. So the next slide probably uh, you back to your Actually, you know, in a country like India, where every 200 kilometer, the style changes, the dialect changes a little, there are innumerable textile styles and innumerable weave patterns. So we have just here spoken about the most famous and very few, a handful of uh, styles. But if you travel through the trail that Shubhankarda has just spoken about, you will find, you know, many other little tweaks, little changes, even you know, local weaves that people wear are so different and so unique to their lifestyle that it's really interesting to actually make a study tour along this line. Absolutely. And uh, we unfortunately could not uh, go up north, but then uh, the north of Bengal is another story completely. You know, yes. the kind <laughs> of the weaves and patterns that are there, it is completely a different, different ball game. So yeah, there is a lot to see. Now, uh, moving on to the rest of India, because, uh, of course, we cannot stay concentrated in one zone or one state. The rest of India is like a Pandora's box when it comes to uh, textiles, especially textiles and, of course, any kind of art form. So since, of course, India is so big and right now, like I said, every 200 kilometers our style changes. Um, we have chosen a couple of state pairings from the Ek Bharat Shresht Bharat uh, format and we will be talking about five of those pairs of states and the, the most prominent textile from those states. Um, this is a trail that we're trying to, uh, you know, develop your interest on or we're trying to just talk about it. Please don't be disheartened if your region or if your state is not included in today's presentation. We will make sure we talk about uh, those special kinds of weaves, special kinds of uh, tapestry or textile sometime. So uh, over to you, Shubham Kurda, if you could just, you know, explain the trail. Uh, yeah, before I, we I was just trying, I was, sure, sure. I was trying to uh, find out how <laughs> many uh, circuits can we develop in the whole of India. And uh, it was uh, completely uh, a big task. We cannot finish it in one day's program. So only a few um, circuits I have mentioned here. There can be more circuits. Even these circuits can be broken into several smaller areas, like the one in Uttar Pradesh, the Banarasi and Chicken Curry circuit. So between Banaras and Lucknow, you can do uh, several other things included, but this is a, a major circuit. The other circuit is in, including Meghalaya in Assam. You have already spoken about Assam and we'll probably tell more about Assam in the next slides. 
So Muga, Eri and Gamocha <coughs> styles of Assam uh, weave. Then uh, Ikkat and Katki and Sambalpuri circuit in Odisha. And uh, also Ikkat in Gujarat and with Patola. So this is a Gujarat circuit. Paitani, you will talk more about that probably. And Kunbi of uh, Goa can be clubbed mm -hmm. together to make another circuit in Maharashtra. The northeastern circuit can be broken into many ones, but as a, just an introductory uh, mm -hmm. circuit, you can include Arunachal Pradesh, Nagaland, and Manipur because these are too many uh, different styles. It will be not possible for you to discuss all, but you may mention a few. And then in down the south, we can have a silk circuit from Kanchipuram, Tanjavur, and Mysore, or we can have cotton circuit of Kotayam and uh, Calicut. You know, Calico fabric, the word comes from Calicut, which is in Kerala. Then, of course, Rajasthan, Ajrak, and Bandhani circuit of Rajasthan. And then we can do this many other, the like Chanderi in Madhya Pradesh, and <clears throat> many other different things from different parts of India. So we will come back with many of these circuits in the future programs probably. And those who are interested may can get in, get in touch with the Department of Tourism Government of India. So we will have more circuits uh, can plan for the people's interest. So now we can move on to the next. Uh... So when we're talking about these state pairings, I think it would be wisest to uh, start from the topmost part of India, so the Jammu and Kashmir. I don't think uh, the picture here needs to be explained to anybody. This is Pashmina weave from Jammu and Kashmir. Now, one of the most famous textiles that have made it, you know, big in the international market is Pashmina or like it is called Kashmir in, in the Western world. Now, Pashmina is made uh, of the, the fleece of the mountain goat which provides with a very warm wool-like texture. And the speciality of the Pashmina shawls, I'm sure everybody has heard it, that it can pass through a very small ring. It is that soft. Now, uh, Pashmina in the 15th century was uh, introduced and then patronized by the king of Kashmir. And they, it was exclusive for the nobles because of the intricacy and uh, the kind of effort that goes into weaving Pashmina. It was it is still very one of the most expensive fabrics that is available globally. Now, later during the Mughal rule, Akbar patronized Pashmina. And in today's world, Pashmina has it, its importance in terms of, of course, shawls, in terms of Pashmina weave saris. And the variety of Pashmina that we found is either embroidered or block printed or, uh, you know, woven textures like the one, the the slide that you can see right now in front of you is somebody embroidering on the pashmina. So these kind of saris, uh, these kind of shawls, we have all of us have one sample from our elder generations in our houses in India, most of us. And uh, we know what a pashmina shawl feels like. The general term for pashmina is Kashmiri shawl. In olden days, people from Kashmir would come to different states and actually ferry these products. You know, older people, older the people from older generations can actually tell you about that. And these were exquisitely woven, exquisitely embroidered shawls that have a very heavy texture and very ornate in terms of uh, design. The designs come, you know, naturally from the Islamic uh, motifs from architectures from murals and these designs are mainly floral and uh, mainly foliage hardly there is any reference of animals or human figures they are not and um, so pashmina has been uh, you know developed i mean to cut it short i think we should stop here because if we go into the details of pashmina and its global appeal it would be a very very large chapter so we would just say that uh, Kashmir provides us with this wonderful, exquisite textile, which is Pashmina. And uh, the pairing state of Kashmir is right down south, which is Tamil Nadu. Since we're talking about, uh, you know, uh, legacies of weaves that come from uh, temple architectures and references of, you know, um, 
heritage properties. I think uh, Kanchipuram weave is one of the most important uh, weaves that can narrate such stories. So let's go into a little into the technical detail of Kanchipuram weaves. In Tamil Nadu, this silk sari, this mulberry silk, is actually um, specialized in terms that the border of the sari is woven uh, separately from the body of the sari. Generally, the border is very heavy. And originally, during the rule of the kings, these used to be real gold. So it is so heavy that it could not be woven on the same loom. And it is characterized by, if you can see, there is a slight zigzag line at the edge of the border. That is the line that joins the border to the sari. And the join, the, the joint or the, the stitch is so strong, the weave is so strong that if the body tears, the silk tears, the zari part would not tear. And of course, uh, for um, please forgive us if we are running through this because we also want to cut it short because there's so much information. We realize that it's it's too much information right now. Uh, if you see that these, these uh, designs, these panels have a direct reference to the temple architecture of South. You can see here the elephant. This uh, elephant motif has been taken from a weave of Kanchipuram saris. And this is, of course, a stone carved elephant from the, you know, the temples. So these references are very, very clear in such saris. Uh, in South India, there's also a, a jewelry format, which is temple jewelry, which also has such design uh, applications. You know, the temple jewelry is also uh, have figures, animal figures, human figures that are taken directly from the walls or the tiles of the temples of uh, that region. So see the references that have, obviously modifications have happened, obviously design elements have been added or subtracted according to the need and the requirement or uh, the convenience of a textile weave. But there is a clear reference of um, motive, a clear reference of the kind of things that the ancient sculptures, uh, sculptures spoke about and what the modern weavers are continuing to talk about. If Shubhankurda would like to throw some light on this additionally. See, when we talk about uh, Kashmir and Tamil Nadu as pairs, it's uh, really very interesting because uh, I know people relate to these uh, two towns in two different ways. One is a religious association of uh, mm -hmm. these two towns, and the other is the textile. Mm -hmm. If you know how uh, we, as a young uh, boy, uh, knew about Kashmir, how the tourists started going into Kashmir, not because they were they knew about the beauty of Kashmir, but because they knew the Kashmiri shawl vendors who used to come and sell Kashmiri shawl or pashmina that you were talking about, and also carpets the yeah. oven carpets <clears throat> so they were so beautiful that people wanted to know how they are made and this is how the first few group of people except the sages who went to uh, meditate in the Kash himalayan mm. region or the adventurists who went to climb the mountains all other tra general travelers went to kashmir just to see this kashmiri shawl and initially they used to stay with the kashmiri shawl vendors so that was, the, uh, I think, one of the earliest example of homestays in India. Yeah. And uh, Kanchipuram also replicated the similar stories because Kanchipuram was very, very costly, expensive, as you said. I have seen people selling very, uh, you know, uh, fragile and very old uh, Kanchipuram sari for a huge amount of money, not because of the sari, but the people it's just bold. take the design. They yeah. just take the design, uh, paint it, and pay it for the design. And the gold is a different thing altogether. So this is why this two clubbing is very interesting. And though it is impossible actually to do in a single uh, trip to uh, yeah. cover both those unless you are doing only aerial trips. <clears throat> Otherwise, it could be a very interesting uh, circuit from Kashmir to Tamil Nadu, probably three weeks. Kashmir to Tamil Nadu via Central India and exploring different other textile formats. So I think we should go to the next one. Kanchipuram again. Like, you we're see talking about the temple references. 
Look at the references temple and the weaving. Even in the the warp uh, the warp beam, you can see the yeah. color of the warp beam and the color of the sari. So these are also replicating the temple pattern as well. So from Kanchipuram, we should move to the next one. The next is uh, a little question about the Kanchipuram weaves. So your question is, what is the speciality of a Kanchipuram weave? The answer was discussed a few minutes back. So choose your answers or options wisely and write down the correct answer in the chat box. Now we move on to the next pairing, uh, which is a pairing of, uh, we start with Maharashtra and following the similar traditions of taking references from, uh, you know, architecture and, you know, paintings and sculpture, the Paithani Saris comes across as one of the most important weaves of Maharashtra or that region of India. The Pethani Sari started off as cotton weaves in Maharashtra, but later on, late, you know, 19th century, 20th century, it, it got transferred to silk. Now, uh, these cotton saris with zari borders, they were a speciality of, uh, you know, they were worn specially by the Peshwas or the family of the Peshwas, where these zaris used to be real gold, like the Kanjivaram. Now, this zari has been replaced by silver threads coated in golden, uh, you know, hue. And that's why we're talking about uh, architectural references is what makes Pethani one of the most interesting saris is it does not take its uh, design references from any, uh, you know, sculpture or any temple. It takes its design references from the Ajanta cave paintings of uh, Maharashtra. Since Pethan is situated in Aurangabad itself, it is very close to that legacy of Ajanta cave paintings. And most of these designs that you see here, the floral motifs, the peacocks, the, the, the vines, they are a direct references of those Ajanta Buddhist paintings. See how these have been adapted by the weavers over ages. So the this, this little um, sepia and black box is an actual slide of one of the paintings from the Ajanta Caves. And see how it has been transformed into a weave pattern in the Pethani Saris. The, the body of the Pethani Saris is what, you know, experts like to call the kaleidoscope uh, weave. The kaleidoscope weave is you know, very commonly called short color because the warp and the weft are of two different colors woven together. So if you move the sari, it almost feels like the, you know, the, the effect the neck of the peacock has. So that is one of the specialities of the Bethani. And if you would like to talk about Ajanta a little, uh, Shubham uh, from where the references come. Ajanta, Ajanta <clears throat> as you said, that we, I also have some uh, painting I can see here from the Ajanta murals. And the murals have been transferred into the fabric, which is very interesting that uh, the saris, as you said, it was used by the Peshwas who were not Buddhists, yes. but they have taken the art uh, inspiration from the Buddhists. And it's very interesting to go to that area. Uh, you can do the entire Deccan trip along with Ajanta and obviously Elora, the spectacular monolith temple. Mm -hmm. So it can be a very uh, specialized <laughs> tour of both the textile and mural painting and cave painting, as well as uh, sculptures and uh, architecture. So, and it can be clubbed with Goa, as uh, probably we'll be talking about it now. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Next, we quickly move on to, uh, before we move on to the next pairing. So, um, your question is from where do Pethani Saris take design references? This is easy. We just spoke about it. We move on to the next slide quickly because I think yes. we're running out of time a little. Yes. We move on to a style format that comes from Orissa and a style format that has traveled across the world. It has come from, you know, it can be seen in Central Asia, it can be seen in parts of America, it can be seen in different parts of um, Asia itself. This is the Ikkat. 
the speciality of ikkat is not specifically in the weave but in the dyeing of the yarn the ikkat uh, specializes in the tie dye format of the yarn where portions of the yarn is dyed in different colors which are strategically placed through you know graphical proportions and such designs are obtained now interestingly these designs although the the tradition the, the actually the style i wouldn't say tradition the style has traveled all across the world and reached orissa at some point of time but interestingly shubham kaur the, the the motifs that are represented in these ikkat sarees in orissa also luckily have direct references to the temple architecture temple. of orissa or the stone carvings of orissa right. so for the viewers you see how you know interestingly a, a, a knowledge or a knowledge base is adapted by the locals and local influences come in and that particular knowledge base develops into something new so the ikkat of orissa or generally what we call the katki sarees because uh, another the ancient name of uh, orissa obviously was katak or kalinga the katki sarees uh, the the design base makes it exclusive ikkat of orissa of the present day these designs cannot be found anywhere no matter where ikkat exists as on date so uh, yeah if you would uh, like to talk about the architecture a little princess uh, you have already uh, shown the architecture beautifully the yes. konark uh, sun temple it is the, one of the wheels of the uh, chariot of the sun temple and also the shardula on the left side uh, bottom yes. corner which has been represented into the uh, textile pattern but uh, it is uh, called katki as you said cut because it is from katak and katak is also known as the birthplace of the great son of mother india netaji subhash chandra bose so this can be clubbed easily to see these two great things together the house where uh, netaji subhash chandra bose was born has been converted into a museum so one can visit that and then from there close distance is nuapatna is a village where this kind of art is still in practice so over to the next one <clears throat> the next we move on to uttar pradesh when you were talking about the trails you were uh, you first had uh, banaras and the uh, chicken curry uh, you know trail of uttar pradesh so we would not be talking about banarasi here but we would uh, go a little into the details of chicken curry now chicken curry as everybody knows is a embroidery technique that you know is a speciality of the lucknow area it the word chicken comes from chik which is jali so you understand how the jali work of stone and marble from especially islamic monuments islamic traditions have a direct reference to chicken curry here if you go into the next slide you will see how this this you know how engravings on the marble are replicated through embroidery with runch stitches as borders and a mesh behind the uh, fabric the actual mesh is created on the wrong side of the embroidery to create that marble effect this is why you know chicken curry is one of the most famous famous textiles after pashmina globally in fact uh, there is a little trivia where i don't know if you will agree that in the 3rd century megasthenes had you know mentioned the flowered muslins which he referred uh, in in you know somewhere and this referred directly to the chicken curry and the most famous folklore is that you know nur jahan the begum nur jahan of the mughal empire was the you know responsible for bringing in this tradition of chicken curry to india and create such beautiful beautiful fabrics no initially um, since muslin was one of the most prized and possessed uh, fabric by the royals chicken curry was initially done on muslin and now uh, present day it is done on cottons chiffons even silks at some point of time and there are a variety of designs that chicken curry is is made of if you see the jali work of any monument you would see there are animal references there are foliage references there are fruits there are leaves even very stark geometric pattern islamic architecture is very um, precise 
representers of uh, geometric patterns. So all these things have a direct effect on chicken curry, like the grass or the leaf pattern here, the you know the, the, the peacock here as animal, the geometric patterns. So these form a very important part. And the most important thing about chicken curry, it is a it is a non-contrasting embroidery. The thread that is generally used traditionally is of the same color as the base of the fabric. So it is almost like a texturing on the fabric, which is very intricate, very time taking. Original chicken curry, which is handmade, obviously a lot of chicken curry right now has been replicated through machinery, which we're not talking about, which we also do not uh, want you to support. But yeah, it is very time taking. So one of the most expensive fabrics that is available in India. Well, when you are in uh, Lucknow and don't confuse the chicken curry and the chicken curry. Both are very important for Lucknow. Here Lucknow is known for its Nawabi food. And the last Nawab of Lucknow, Wasif Ali, uh, uh, was uh, Nawab Wazid Ali Shah, who was in exile in Kolkata. And he brought with him the special dish from Lucknow, the biryani, which has been adopted here. And it's called Kolkata biryani. It was brought to Hyderabad. It becomes Hyderabadi biryani. And so when we talk about uh, the textile form, every time we say chicken curry, people think, how many chicken curries are you <laughs> talking about? Now, I'm not going into that details anymore, but Lucknow is a very important city. It has seen a lot of ups and downs and the beautiful uh, structural evidences of the end's glorious past. It has seen the beautiful architecture and the uh, famous uh, ghazal singers and the ghazal composers, Mirza Ghalib and all. And also Lucknow is known for its dance form, Kathak, which was originated here. So once you are visiting uh, Lucknow, make sure that you put this into your program along with the beautiful textiles of Lucknow. Visit the Lucknow Bazaar. It is one of the most beautiful place to be in and indulge yourself into the shopping of chicken curry. Actually, both so, the chicken curries. In both, both the, the chicken form. curries, yes, absolutely. Okay. Now we move to a very, very interesting zone. This we will uh, run through very quickly because the the area that we're talking about has 26 tribes and 26 of which tribes have different weaves. So we will talk about the weaves of Arunachal Pradesh as a whole concept. Now weaves of Arunachal Pradesh, interestingly, have very strong cultural references when it comes to uh, these particular tribes who wear them. These are coarse materials which have generic geometric patterns and um, from the design of the weaves or the color of these uh, yarns that are used different stories are narrated so the motifs that you can see here all have a different meaning and it cannot be worn without a particular reason for example say about uh, a particular kind of waistband can be only worn by the unmarried uh, girls Another different kind with a different pattern and different color can be only worn with uh, by the married women. So, you know, hunters, the chief of the villages, uh, different categories of people, people from different social structures, all have these specific mm -hmm. waves which look similar, but the motives inside and the color placement and the color patterns all make them different. And it kind of uh, makes it clear of the makes clear of the social standards or the social uh, implications of those, you know, weaves. So um, as you can see, mainly geometric patterns are very important here. Uh, we will just discuss a couple of uh, patterns because uh, we don't have time for everything. So these red dots, interesting, the most funny and interesting aspect is it is the ferment that is used in a beer making process. So you can understand how everything from food to lifestyle to everything is represented through uh, textile weaves. Arrowheads, wherever used, means uh, 
you know, triangles means arrowheads or the hornbill. The hornbill is a very important bird there. They also rep represent hornbill through, you know, very pointy arrows and triangles. And uh, of course, colors have a meaning. Red means blood enemy. Blue means the sky. So all of these things have a meaning and see how a group of girls belonging to different, uh, you know, sections of society, different occupations, different tribes even, have all different styles of weaves. Each of these weaves are special to their particular tribe. So I think this is the only overview we are going to give you today because once we get into the details of this, this is going to be a huge, huge chapter by itself. But we have a question for you here. What do pointed triangles indicate in the textiles of Arunachal Pradesh? Uh, Shubhankar, would you like to talk about Arunachal Pradesh a little? I think it will be a very uh, long story now no. to cut down it short. That Arunachal Pradesh is one of the most intricate uh, state. It's a mountainous state. And therefore, uh, their textile is also different. The most important thing is that they use only natural colors in their textile. Mm. And what is readily available there. Number two is that they, each tribe, as you have already said, are uh, divided into many sub-tribes. And so they have each pa have their own uh, patterns. If you want to travel that, you will actually traveling the whole tribal circuit starting in three different sections of Arunachal Pradesh. Uh, one is the <clears throat> Tawang, Bamdila, Itanagar side. The other is the Zero, Pasighat and Alom side. And uh, the last one is the Namdafa side. So these three different sections of Arunachal can be only accessed from three different entry points in Assam. So if you are planning a tour of Arunachal Pradesh, you must include the uh, corresponding Assamese states, uh, Assamese uh, districts, and then explore more of Assam um, textile and uh, you know monuments as well. Arunachal Pradesh can be also clubbed with the two other important uh, places of the Northeast, that is uh, Manipur and Nagaland. If time permitted, uh, Shreya would have told you all about yes. these uh, things. But uh, if you are planning a trip to Arunachal Pradesh, give yourself at least two weeks time and try to visit all these places at a time. So we can now go to the next uh, slide. Yes, we quickly move on to the next two pairs. The first pair is, uh, the first state from the first pair is Jharkhand. And we will talk quickly about the silk that is produced in Jharkhand. Um, we're talking here about the Kuchai silk, which comes from the cocoons not grown on mulberry trees, but sal and arjun trees. So this silk is a lightweight and very smooth silk. Uh, you know, contrasted by another form of silk weaving of Jharkhand, which is the ghicha. Ghicha is the coarse silk. So the Kuchai and the Ghicha are the two main um, tasar uh, weaves that are found in Jharkhand. The Kuchai is uh, generally characterized by a plain flat weave on the body and also on the borders like you uh, saw on the, you know, this slide. And Ghicha is more of coarse. This is the, uh, the second layer of the cocoon, which is the, 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 the yarn is more coarse and it forms a texture, a finer texture than kesh, but much like kesh. So these two are the most important weaves of Jharkhand. And um, is there anything that you would want to add? I'm sorry, I'm moving really fast because I think we've crossed. Uh, yeah, yeah. The, I think time. Jharkhand can be uh, clubbed with uh, Orissa or Bengal. And yes. if you are planning a trip to Jharkhand to see this uh, beautiful silk, you also have to prepare yourself to encounter the one of the oldest part of India's cave paintings, the earliest settlers mm. of the human kind. So you must be visiting the Hazari Bagh and Palamo area to explore that trail as well. So it will be a different trail altogether, a different experience. And you must be accustomed to the tribal lifestyle and the beautiful paintings and the design on the tribal huts to be explored. Over to the next, please. Next, uh, oh, there is a question. On which trees do the cocoon for Kuchai silk grow?
we quickly move on to the next zone, which is Goa. Very unfortunate, but very popularly known as uh, the party zone of India, Goa, I, I must, uh, you know, uh, tell you, and I think Shubhankoda would also agree that Goa has a lot of cultural aspects to offer. You can actually go and see there are a lot of tradition, a lot of crafts, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, traditional aspects that can be interesting, you know, uh, besides the party and the casino scene. So here we would talk about the Kunbi weaves of Goa. This is the traditional cotton weave, which comes generally in the red-white combination or the black and red checks. Now, white is, you know, it, it represents purity and red represents vigor. Now, kunbi saris are worn by the field working women of Goa, the, the generally short saris. And those two qualities of vigor and uh, purity, of course, unfortunately, is very important for females everywhere. But that, that aspect of vigor and aspect of life, of, of working, of uh, generating livelihood is what is characterized by the color selection of a traditional kunbi weave. Uh, kunbi, uh, with, with the going away of the Portuguese, with, with the disappearance of the Portuguese from Goa, kunbi, you know, was um, the, the tradition of kunbi was also disappearing among the, the Goan population, which was again revived through synthetic invent, uh, interventions by designers. By synthetic, I don't mean they had messed with the tradition, but it was not something that came from the communities itself. It was an external intervention by the designers who tried to revive the kunbi mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, take it out to the world. Today, kunbi is very popular among, you know, all over India, at least, and as a very, very coarse, but very strong, but important kind of cotton weave. So this is one of the traditional kunbi, like I said, it is red and white checks. So these kind of saris can be seen worn by um, the, the field workers, the women, the, the farmers, the, you know, the wood gatherers, everybody wears these similar saris. And right now, we would just move a little um, quickly to the next and the last pairing of our discussion, which is uh, Rajasthan paired with Assam. Mm -hmm. And since Rajasthan has a plethora of, uh, you know, handicrafts and textiles and different uh, things that it has already offered to the world, we would like to select, we have selected one particular and most interesting uh, textile building format, which is Ajrak printing. Now, the word Ajrak, like um, in, in case of Shantipur, Shubankarta was talking about the importance of indigo and how indigo used to be important at one of the time. Ajrak is the name that comes from the Arabic word Azrak, which means blue. So you understand how important uh, indigo is for the printing process of this, this uh, textile. Now, Ajrak printing is a completely hand printed process where it is generally done on cotton, um, where wooden blocks, such wooden blocks are used and multiple blocks are superimposed on each other to create one particular pattern. So if you see the bigger uh, photograph here, there is one, there has already been a line drawing which is placed. Now the color filling is being done by another block and probably another layer of intricacy would be added. And in the inset, you can see how, you know, these two blocks are used to, have been used to make the fabric that it is lying on. So you can see the difference in intricacies and you can understand how the layering happens in, in case of Ajrak. So Ajrak is one of the most famous, uh, famous printing uh, techniques of India. And Many mills, many printing uh, factories are now replicating ajrak. But if you actually see ajrak in its original format, you can smell the indigo. You can smell the natural dye. One of the most important aspects of ajrak is ajrak traditionally uses natural dye to actually dye the fabric and also, you know, use it as an application applicant dye. So uh, the beauty and the ornamentation 
has also references from the wall murals of Rajasthani palaces, the Meenakari of the Rajasthani palaces, the motifs of the Rajasthani palaces, but we're not getting into the details since we are running out of time here. But of course, Ajrak printing also like the Kanjivaram and the Kanjipuram and the Balochodi saris takes design references from, uh, you know, monuments. So if you if you understand in, at the same time when a cluster of people try to try to develop the culture of an area, culture of a, a region, so artists evolved, textile weavers evolved, sculptors evolved, mural artists evolved, and all of them took references from the same, um, you know, knowledge base and created these wonderful separate items, which together make up for the heritage of a region. So, you know, one thing without the other does not really complete the cycle of heritage of a particular region. So if you go and see textiles, I think it would be very, very important for you to also go and see the monuments, the temples, the refer to books, miniature paintings that talk about the artists or the patron artists of um, those times. So all of this will give you an actual trail from where a particular art form evolves and where it is reached today. And paired with Ajra, we have the last state of uh, India, which is Assam. And we will end uh, our presentation with one of the most vibrant silks uh, available in India. The silk is called Muga, which literally is the golden fiber. It is the, the characteristic of a Muga silk is it is kept unbleached and untampered because the fiber itself has a gold sheen. I will show you the color of the thread in a while. So you can understand if the silk itself is that shiny and that, that perfect, the sari has, you know, it, it looks almost like a golden foil with Meenakari work. And this Meenakari work is also a part of the weave itself. It is not embellishment. It is not embroidered. So this, this is the thread or the yarn, the silk that is used to weave a muga. The Muga also has, um, you know, a very, it was, it was patronized by the nobles and uh, it is mainly woven in the Shualguchi area. So there was a point of time when Muga was uh, not allowed to go, go to the regular public because the, the royalty claimed Muga as their own golden yarn, you know, own golden fabric. But later on, as, as you know, uh, time advanced, the, the patterns of Muga changed, the pattern, the, the price points changed. And today, in most of the households in Eastern India, or at least in the zone where I belong from, have at least one Muga sari in their closet. The Mekhola, the, the traditional Mekhola chador of the Assamese women is made of a Muga silk. So this is how, you know, this is, these are the patterns. These are um, the foliage, the flowers, very geometric uh, applications of flowers, stripes, borders, which make up for a muga weave. It is actually very ornate and it is contrasted by that golden yarn. When you talk about muga silk, Assam is actually a, a wonderful place and it has not only this uh, silk, it is a nature's wonder actually. You have beautiful landscapes, the national park, and the architecture all together. And it is the gateway to the Northeastern India. So if you are planning a trip on the textile heritage of Eastern and Northeastern India, then Assam or its capital Guwahati can be your base point from where you can move on to the various different part of Assam and Meghalaya, and then to Arunachal, Nagaland, Mizoram, and <clears throat> other places and visit not only the sari, but uh, uh, gamocha as well is another very interesting weave, gamocha, which is cotton. And uh, there is another silk eri, which is yeah. available in this region. So you can explore that. Assam is a huge state and is the largest state in terms of the number of handloom weavers in India. So Assam has the maximum number of handloom weavers. Uh, and after Assam is uh, West Bengal, these are the two largest state in terms of the uh, demographic distribution of the weavers in India. So if you are in Assam, you can see weaving 
almost every village. So that I think is uh, our point and now. Yes, we will end the discussion with the last question. If you have liked this um, discussion session, we would like to uh, request you to, you know, uh, follow our Facebook, Instagram and Twitter pages and also subscribe to our YouTube channel, the YouTube channel of uh, the you know, uh, Ministry of Tourism. And your question is, which region of Assam is famous for Muga silk production? So with this, we come to the end of this session. Uh, we would seriously like to request every viewer to at least, you know, experience these textiles, not from showrooms, not from, not through catalogs, but actually, if, if possible, go and visit at least one or at least two of these places and see for yourself how textile develops and what are the uh, social or uh, the, the cultural conditions of the place that help, help the growth of a certain craft form. You know, considering textile is a very broad, broad craft form and many aspects and also are also, yeah. And also to participate in the preservation of yes. our national heritage, yes. our uh, pride in all different style of uh, textile and handicrafts. So and this, what uh, uh, is is uh, unfortunate is in also you know it is a catch twenty two situation that when we talk about intangible cultural heritage, most of the processes, most of the knowledge is undocumented. Yes. The the textiles that we have spoken about have somewhat been documented, but there are many, many textile forms, especially the tribal textile, which have no documentation and the knowledge is dissipating. So, you know, till there is still time, I would like to request all of you to actually go and see for yourselves how textile has grown with different tribes, different communities, different sections of our community and how the whole vast, you know, the plethora of Indian textile comes together as, you know, one, you know, unified concept. Yes. And share the pride of being Indian. In, yes, uh, the pride of being Indian. Ex uh, exploring these villages with the people and uh, sharing your... Uh, Unfortunately, uh, these textiles, when we find in most of the showrooms or the shops which are not owned by the state or not owned by people who are knowledgeable sell duplicate textiles yeah which we uh, which we don't really uh, understand because the duplication is so fine so it only helps when you actually go and visit the clusters and see for yourself what the real thing is till it's still there uh, till and then the other we would thing like that, yeah uh, the people generally uh, go for the uh, fake ones because it is ma machine made cheaper. and therefore it's cheaper so please make sure that when you are buying a handloom you are ready to pay a little bit extra because it is done by a human being and normally a weaving family does it all in one family yeah. it's not an employee uh, employer relationship it's a family relationship so you are encouraging that family relationship so just for example, I would like to say for a very intricate sari, one sari takes about four to five days to weave. And that four of these saris would actually feed a family of maybe 10 for the whole month. So do not bargain, please. And with this, we would like to take your leave. Um, I Thank hope you, you very like much. This, uh, I hope you like this program. And uh, please feel free to let us know if you would like... Uh, you know, us to talk about any other formats or any other uh, textile that we missed out on today. Till then, uh, good night. Good night and Namaskar.